He believes that agriculture must change to a more natural model in order to remain profitable and truly sustainable into the future. He also knows that rehydrating the land is critical to building more healthy and resilient soils to support that model. And Lance has over 20 years experience providing advice and support to landholders and government agencies in this area. And I'm just going to do a quick intro as well for Cole. Cole actually started in the NTG in 1970, which is a while ago now, but I, I was born before that. Um, and he's been involved with the Alice Springs Dust Control Project in the past and has considerable experience with pastoral and indigenous properties throughout Central Australia. So, and Tim was introduced previously, so I won't re go over that. <coughs> so the purpose of this panel discussion <coughs> is to have, to discuss lessons learned, um, identify the great results and new technologies that have been developed over the years, how we can harness all this information and move forward to improve adaptation processes and increase uptake in our great landscapes. So I'm going to hand over to Mike now and he's going to um, lead the discussion and seek input and feedback from these three experience. Uh, I was just going to follow one question and hopefully there are all five in the audience here. So um, is that the Alice Springs Dust Thanks, Mike. Yeah, so in, in WA it's similar. We've got legislation about water and environment and soil conservation um, and regulation, people regulating. Probably our land clearing laws are not quite as, how can I put it, rigid as yours are at the moment, but um, so it's an issue. So um, when we were doing this, I actually went to the government agencies and said, look, what do we need to do in terms of permits? And, uh, and I got some of the key regulators from each agency, and we've got an exceptionally good example of this on a farm, only about 80 k's out of Perth. Just took them up there and walked them through it and said, well, this is what we do. Um, and, and a key bit of what we do uh, is that we're trying to restore natural functions to the landscape. So we all read the landscape and, and we try and do as little as we can just to restore what was happening before. And I found once I explained it to them and the creek was flying and they could see it, I said, oh, yeah, that's great. And at the end of it, I said, okay, well, what permits do you need? And they said, oh, we're pretty busy at the moment. You're doing a good job. We've got too much work. No, you're fine. Go away. Uh, don't, don't come and bother us because we think you're doing a good job. But I'm not actually comfortable with that. So us through all know if you get it wrong, we've all made mistakes that it turns into disasters. If you're going to do this, you've actually got to get it right because if you do it and you get it wrong, you'll end up with a bigger mess than you started. So what I think is, is required is not that you guys put the permits, it's people like us are certified. That's where it should be. Um, so you don't have to do the paperwork. We're certified and if we stuff up it, they'll take our certification away. So that, that would be my suggestion. We haven't got it in WA, but I really think that's what we need in WA and I would suggest that might be a much better approach for you in the Territory. I should, I just a follow on, I guess, for, so you have to have a land clearing firm or you suspect not. Are you actually clearing land to, to create the, the banks and breaks or something? As, as very little as possible. That, that's a key. We will, we will, 
so when I do it, I think if we've got to push too much dirt, we haven't got the design wrong, let's rethink it. So the key is to doing as little as possible, but doing it well. We're not re-engineering landscapes, we're just restoring function. So a minimal amount, cold. Yep. For sure, yeah. Yeah, we're not clearing acres and acres and acres for the government people to get up and say you need a land clearing permit. We're just doing little tickles here and there, so I don't believe we should need it. Me and the government don't get on just quietly, but that's all right. Um, um, any other questions though, because... If I can just add to that one, I think one of our principal aims is to actually encourage perennial vegetation or longer term vegetation. So obviously removing trees or plants is against what we're doing, so we're going to try and minimise that as, as much as possible to try and regenerate in the future. Can, can I add to that too? So that I, I put up that photo of the before and the after farm, and we've had a whole pile of people and ministers out there, and they, you show them that. So this was what it was like four years ago, and they can't believe it. They said, did you plant all this? No, we didn't. So everywhere we've done this successfully, the regeneration has been spectacular. And if you put a dollar on what would it cost, you know, three bucks a stem to put all those plants in, it's saved a fortune. So if we get it right, Mother Nature does all the work for us, and we will get this, this massive improvement in uh, biodiversity as a result of getting the water right for free. All right, just to keep you amused then, if you're not going to answer, throw questions at us, et cetera, et cetera, I'll tell you a story of um, a guy that I had to go and see way out in the scrub. All right, can you all hear me? Yep. yep, beauty. Now, this man was a government man. I've worked with the government, and there's a lot of government people here. I like them. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Uh, and the government allowed me to do a lot of things that I would never have been able to do anyway. So I'm not entirely against governments, etc., etc. Just their bureaucracy, their stupidity, etc., etc. You know? uh, but now I've got to tell you a story that I was sent out one day. Right, this relates to soil conservation. Right, I was sent out one day on I think it was the Marini Loop Road, and this was years and years ago to have a look at a project officer who was um, supervising the actual road and drainage, right? So anyway, I went out and I'm having a look around, looking around, and there's this vehicle parked under the shady tree, right? And I'm sort of, I bet that's him. It has to be. A lot of government cars park under trees, shady trees, etc., etc., claiming they're having their lunch. So anyway, this fella hops out in a floral shirt and he's wearing Jesus Christ sandals and he got them long board short things down to your knee caper, right? And I thought, this project matter? No, it can't be, it must be tourists. So when I walk up to him and uh, he said, are you Cole Stanton? I said, yes, I'm Cole Stanton. Are you such and such? Yes, I am. I so, said, you know, I'm looking him up and down thinking, don't say nothing, Cole, just shake his hand because he's obviously the project manager, so it'd be nice. So anyway, I shook his hand, and then I said, well, I'm out here to have a look, see how you're going with this road drainage. Yeah, no, come with me, Cole. And I'd hop in his car, and it smelled all funny, eh? It smells that a man car don't normally smell. All the smelly stuff in there, I don't know what it was. Uh, but floral shirt most probably gives you an indication what the smell was. But anyway, we're driving along and he'll pull up. And he's got these elephant trenches. Right, you can fit two Toyotas in them. Depth and width. And he pull up alongside them and said, now what do you think, Cole? And I'm looking at him, what are these? What do you start mining or something, are you? What are you, uh, what are you doing? I oh, know these are to save the road, Cole, from getting flooded. So see the hills there? As the water runs off these hills, we trap it in these trenches, right? So it doesn't go across the road. And I said, yeah, but when it rains, it also rains here on the road. So you might capture some of it, but um, why the trenches for? 
And he said, want us to save the road? And I said, all right then. That's a good idea, but I don't, I wouldn't do it, all right? Now, one thing you're going to do straight away is you're going to kill tourists, right? You know, when you pull over the road and you go to have a little quiet moment with nature or whatever, you're going to fall in that trench. Hey. Then your cattle are going to fall in that trench. Your car's going to fall in the trench. All the animals that live, they're going to fall in the trench. So you're going to have a whole trench full of all these things that shouldn't be there. They're supposed to be driving on the road safely. Hmm. You'll see what you mean, Cole. Um, so how do you think we should go about saving this road? And I said, well, you've got all these stupid bee drains, right? Backfill all your bee drains. Now, I don't like bee drains. You'll hear me talk about bee drains. I do not like bee drains, right? Backfill your bee drains and make them flat bottomed. And only put them out from here to there. Not a bee drain from here to Alice Springs, right? And don't drop it on somebody's fence line, right? That's all you need. And guess what? You're going to have to backfill these trenches. Oh, well, who's going to pay for that? You know, so much of us taxpayers. But your work mum are going to do that. You're going to backfill them because you've got everybody liable on this road here. Now, I guarantee when you finish talking with me whilst you're up here, um, I'm going to stuff up all your road trips because you're not going to enjoy the landscape anymore. You're going to be looking at V-drains and, and all kinds of drains that are along the roadside. A lot of you people may think, oh, that's good, they're draining the road. But if you look closely, <laughs> why? Right? When you do make a road, lay it on the landscape. Don't gouge it, sweep it. It's as simple as that. Now that's the story I'm saying that stupidity, right? You may want to be doing something, but do it properly. Read the landscape, right? Don't push water where it can't go. You can't push water up here unless you use one hell of a gigantic pump, right? So don't start digging things up there to try and get water up there, right? So stupidity. So if you don't know how to do it, don't do it at all. Call us three blob. And we'll, you know, we'll do it for you. Get somebody that knows. As simple as that. Put your hands up who knows anything about soil erosion control. Who knows what? Soil erosion control. Put your hands up. Hey? I'm sure. Put your hands up high. Higher. All these shy ones, put them up higher. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. So all the ones that didn't put their hands up, you'll soon know when we finish with you, all right? You'll be able to talk to talk and walk the walk. So thank you very much. Any questions? They've got to be now. Focus is on how can we move forward and improve the adoption processes and increase uptake in our great landscapes. So I'm Yeah, just a couple of points. So first is how do you finance it? And, and the pastoral industry is low returns per hectare, so that's a challenge. Um, Peter's going to be talking tomorrow about a new model for financing. So the people that benefit downstream and down the food chain um, can help pay for it. So we just need to figure that out. You're, you're custodians of the land. You supply the rest of us with food, but you supply some really important services. So that, that's a model we're working on. The, the other one is, um, Cole and I are getting on a bit, and Peter Andrews is older. Um, Lance is young, it's good. Um, so the, uh, to get broad scale adoption, we actually need more people with knowledge and skills. So I think training is the absolutely critical bit for taking this forward, and there is a fair bit of knowledge to getting it right. Um, and one of the best ways to train is hands on on the ground. So demonstrations, practical demonstrations as training tools. Uh, in, uh, over at home, we're actually, um, so 
the other key player of our team is Rod O'Brien, the farmer, who's really skilled at it. And we've been, or he has, been training young Indigenous kids um, out of school, and you know, 15, 16 year olds. And some of them have got huge potential. You know, they very skilled, will become very skilled machinery operators, and some of them really read the land well. So that's been a sort of focus for us. Um, it, it, it particularly, not only, but particularly with uh, young Indigenous kids to uh, create uh, careers for them and business opportunities doing what they should be doing back on country. So that's an approach we're taking. But training really is absolutely essential because you've got to know what you're doing to get this right. Yeah. Lance? I think um, this sort of forum is probably a good thing because hopefully you guys will go back home and we might have opened your eyes just a little bit to something a little bit different to what you're used to and you might be seeing things differently, differently in your landscape. And perhaps between the three of us and a few others, we might be able to um, show a few tips in terms of how you can read the landscape differently from what you have been before. Um, and then that might lead you to better ideas and what you can do as well, because you're the one who actually lives on the land. You know that land really well. I don't, because I've not been there. Um, so that your own knowledge and your own ability is just op us hopefully opening up yourself up to that a little bit so that you can then take it on yourself. Um, I think that's... Yeah. Good. Just another one, we've got any state or particularly federal people here. So maybe the way to progress that is you are the land managers and we can be the gurus, the trainers. So maybe what we require is some funding that, we, that will pay for us to go out and help you learn to do it. Learn by doing it, I think, might be the best way forward. <laughs> Final word. <laughs> Sorry about it. that. Oh, question. I'm not very shy. I'm even better than my microphone. So I just wanted to touch on Paul's point, and I think it's important for us to remember that there's not really that many um, pastoralists in the room today. There's a lot of people that can influence policy um, on a state and federal level. And just going back to Paul's point earlier about you know bee drains and. Um, most of the pastoral properties are littered with um, gazetted roads and they're not gazetted, um, they're cared for in some way, shape or form by either state or federal funding. Um, we'd like to see more examples, please, through roads um, network of those good practices because then we can look, as you said, you do all my road trips because now we just look at these massive big bee drains. If we can see the good practices in action by um, state and federal government funding, then we can take lead from those experiences and also mining um, networks going through our pastoral properties nowadays. Um, so I think it's not just pastoral action, we can probably take um, lessons from um, the funding available through good practice. Very good, boy. Um, I've been fighting with the, uh, the agencies for years and years in regards to bee drains, trenches, etc., etc., all over the flat, but always come up against um, this is how we've always done it, right? There's a template made in Darwin, it's flipped down to Alice Springs. So if you travel along a highway, you have what we call a caterpillar, right? For every kilometre, there are eight bee drains either side. Doesn't matter if they go uphill, that's what's in their template, right? So I've been trying to change that for years and years. Flat bottom drains, you've got to have flat bottom drains. V drains turbulate, cause erosion. Flat bottom drains spread, and, you don't, and you've only got to have them from here to there. Now you know what they did with the V drains when they heard people starting to complain about V drains? They put a hook on it. Oh, it does move fast, eh? Hey? That's all right, we'll put a hook on it. So they put it back, the hook, bring the water back onto the road again. Uh, do it. So that was their way of fixing it. So one day, maybe when I'm in my rocking chair or something like that, in some old time was home or under a gum tree out here, somebody might come up and say to me, Cole, guess what? They don't make bee trains anymore. And I'll say, you ripper, you little beauty. Now my last passing word on this is, we all live in a borrowed landscape, so be careful what you do. Thank you.